Watch this. For a decade and a half, Idaho's legislature has refused to add four words to Idaho's Human Rights Act. It's still early in the session, but it looks like that streak will stretch to 16. Idaho's already hot rental market could soon come with more costs should this bill become law, especially in Boise. And that's got a lot of you talking. More than 4,200 Idahoans have died from COVID during the pandemic, each death just as difficult as the last. But an obituary of a young mother shows how the pandemic is impacting more than just those infected with the virus. This is the most peaceful way we can think of. Since the 2012 legislature began. To both protest the fact that year after year, we are denied a public hearing. Add the words Idaho has placed sticky notes. And to make sure that those across the state can have their voices heard inside the Capitol. On the chamber doors of the House and Senate. Our sticky notes are simply words, not a permanent fixture. Just our calm way of respectfully and quietly bringing the voices of and stories of thousands of Idahoans here. Each note says something different, but each one carries the same message. No Idahoan should have to live in fear of being fired just for being gay or being denied housing or educational opportunities just based on the fact that they're gay. That was KTVB Scott Evans reporting on the Add the Words campaign from 10 years ago. She was speaking with Ashley Thompson and Misty Tolman back on January 16th, 2012, almost 10 years ago to the day. And to this day, it remains legal in Idaho for a business to refuse to serve or a landlord refuse to rent to a person who is LGBTQ. Sure, there are pockets around the state, like in Ada County, a dozen other cities, where that kind of discrimination is outlawed. But for the past 16 legislative sessions, there has been a push by a group of Idahoans to make it statewide, to add four words to Idaho's Human Rights Act. Four words, sexual orientation and gender identity. As in Idaho Code 675901, to secure for all individuals within the state freedom from discrimination because of race, color, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or national origin or disability in connection with employment, public accommodations, and real estate property transactions, which is how they want that bill to look like, or that law to look like. But for the 16th time, that legislation likely won't see the light of day. Representative John McCrosty did introduce a personal bill yesterday in the House, but personal bills typically don't get any sort of public hearing. Fitting, the bill was co-sponsored by 16 other legislators from both the House and the Senate. Now, this was a campaign that began back in 2006 when a coalition was formed to get legislation passed to add those four words to the already existing law. But for years, according to the Add the Words people, Republicans blocked every attempt to even allow a public hearing on it. In 2010, the Idaho Safe Schools and Fair Employment Working Group did manage to get a bill formally printed and introduced. It was Senate Bill 1033, but it failed on a party line vote in committee. The next year, the Add the Words campaign had a name and they started putting those sticky notes on the doors like you just saw. And that continued into 2012. Still no public hearing. Then in 2014, Add the Words Idaho decided they're going to get serious. And they started silent, peaceful protests inside the Capitol building, wearing those black T-shirts you also saw saying Add the Words. And it was a session of citations and arrests, the first one happening on February 3rd, 2014, outside Senate chambers. The 120 arrests were enough to get some attention because not that session, but the following session, 2015, on January 16th, a hearing took place in the House State Affairs Committee that lasted several days. Hundreds testified before the committee from all over the state, and this was before Zoom. However, once again, it failed to get out of that committee by a party line vote of 13 to 4, Republicans representing the 13 nay votes there. And that was the last time there was a public hearing to consider adding sexual orientation and gender identity to Idaho's Human Rights Act. But every year since, someone has tried. And this year was no different, with Representative John McCrosty putting forth that personal bill, with little chance of it going anywhere. He knows that. But the idea is to keep it on people's radar, he told us today. We wanted to know, after 16 years and seven years since the last public hearing on it, What's it going to take for Idaho to add the words? You know, there's going to, it's going to take a, a number of things. Some of it is going to take more conversations. Uh, you know, this is the bill that we had the hearing on 
uh, seven years ago um, during my first session in the legislature. Um, maybe this isn't the right bill, but we need to at least talk about what is it about this bill that um, that gives people angst. Um, you know, if it's if it's the overall concept, then obviously that becomes a non-starter. But I, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around this idea that it's not the right bill. It's literally adding four words to an already existing law. What more could be? I mean, it seems so simple. It sh it should be really simple. You know, if we don't have the conversation, then no, it's not going to do anything. If you think they uh, were to come up with a bill this session that would add the two words vaccination status to the Idaho Human Rights Bill, what are the chances that would pass? Um, that's a that's an interesting question. And uh, and I think that was actually posed uh, in the last session. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Maybe it will be answered later on this legislative session. It, you know, that's entirely a possibility. And, um, you know, I, if we can have that conversation, then I hope we can have this conversation as well. If one, why not the other, right? McCrossy said there are models out there Idaho could use, like in Utah, which passed the same thing back in 2015, should lawmakers entertain the idea of considering a bill like this. The point of bringing it forth for the 16th time is to hopefully open up that conversation, McCrossy says. By the way, Representative McCrossy, isn't at the State House this week. He's a teacher by trade, fifth and sixth grade music in the Boise School District. And he would usually have a full time substitute during the legislative session so he can focus on, you know, legislating. But because of a shortage of substitutes, he's having to teach this week. And it will likely happen again next month. Staff shortages having an impact everywhere, obviously. Another bill that has had a lot of you talking on social media, House Bill 442, having to do with rental fees and deposits. And in a state like Idaho, one of the hottest real estate markets in the country where rents are increasing pretty much at a rate some Idahoans can't keep up with, almost as much as houses themselves, it's hit a nerve. We touched a little bit on this yesterday. The bill introduced by Representative Joe Palmer of Meridian would, if passed, give homeowners and landlords more freedom to charge whatever they wanted for not only rent, but for application fees and deposits. Right now, that control belongs to local governments. Katya Stepovic joins us now to go over what the new bill would and would not mean. Katya? Well, Brian, this bill would affect cities just like Boise, who already have a rental application fee cap in place. Now, that was passed back in 2019, and it currently is capped at $30. That money can only be used for hard costs like background checks and credit checks, and landlords or property management companies cannot profit off of those fees. But should House Bill 442 pass, it would remove all local control and put the decision to raise rents, fees, and deposits in the hands of landlords and homeowners. We heard from Representative Palmer yesterday while introducing the proposed new law. Take a listen. Currently in Idaho code, it, the control of rent is not legal for local units of government to control that. It all depends on the landlord and how they set their rules and regulations. In the current legislation that we have, in current statute, excuse me, it doesn't have anything about fees and deposits. I believe that was probably missed 30 years ago when they put this piece of legislation in. And so all this is basically to me is a cleanup bill we're going through and um, adding that into it. And so the basic addition to the bill is just the fees, and depo fees or deposits is also added on to it. And as we mentioned earlier, the city of Boise passed its own rental fee ordinance that was spearheaded by city councilwoman Lisa Sanchez. And while those for the bill say it would offer protection to homeowners and landlords, Sanchez says property can be replaced and repaired. The damage on families for losing their homes, that's permanent. Prior to us passing the 2019 ordinance, people were being taken advantage of. They were being scammed. We are going to have people um, living in their cars. We're going to have people uh, losing their dignity. Um, and we're going to have people uh, being in harm's way. I consider having adequate housing to be uh, part of a healthy community. I'm trying to remain hopeful that, that we have uh, folks at the State House who uh, are truly dedicated to helping our community members. But when I see this type of legislation being brought forward, it's really hard. It's hard to maintain that hope and that 
generous thinking towards others. She says in 2021, the city of Boise conducted a housing needs survey and 67% of renters could not afford the units the market is producing. The current average rent in Boise is over $1,400. Take this for an average 880 square foot apartment. Rent has increased over the last year alone by 20%. And Brian, as we touched on earlier, and as you can imagine, this has a lot of people up in arms. Take a look at some of the comments we received on Facebook. Marcine Ross says Representative Palmer is definitely only representing landlords and not the people renting. Alex Morenes says while she's generally she generally leans towards a free market, she can't bring herself to believe this or this is the right time for legislation like this, given all the issues that Idahoans face today, particularly in housing. Hashtag priorities. And Jeremy Emmett says you cannot restrict private business. Go live somewhere else. All right, now the bill will be assigned a committee in the coming days and have a public hearing. And obviously, we will continue to follow this bill as it makes its way through the state house. If passed, it would be in effect on or after July 1st of 2022. Brian. All right, well, I guess a lot of people can get behind that idea of a deposit. You have somebody who may be an at risk, maybe hasn't done the best credit or rental history. You want to increase the deposit. That's fine. But it's the fees that I think a lot of people get burned on because you pay these fees and you don't even get the place a lot of times. You pay them and they tack them on somehow and get people to pay them. And exactly, they're not reimbursed for those fees and they might not even ever get that rental house. Yeah, so it's kind of discriminating, I guess, the pre per It's, yeah. All right, we'll see how this goes. Damn. Yep. All right, thank you very much, Katia. Well, as Katia mentioned, we talked about this briefly during yesterday's show. We also got another text from Kurt who asked, does Representative Palmer own rental property? Kind of alluding to the fact that maybe he's proposing this legislation because he wants to increase fees when he's renting out places. Good question considering the subject. Katia mentioned we reached out to Representative Palmer several times over the past couple of days, hoping to get his input on the bill, ask him those questions, but we haven't received any response as of yet. We were able to do a little bit of investigating ourselves through open records, meaning anyone who has access to this information, but we could not find any information indicating Mr. Palmer does own any rental properties within the state of Idaho. Over in the House Revenue and Taxation Committee, a bill we first told you about last week, the Income Tax Relief Bill, pegged as the largest tax cut in Idaho history. Getting started on that today, $600 million in tax cuts and rebates of Idahoans. Sounds great, right? Breaks down like this. $350 million would be cut in a one-time tax rebate of about 75 bucks per person and the people they are assigned to, meaning their dependents. And there would be $250 million in ongoing income and corporate income tax breaks. It would also consolidate Idaho's five income tax brackets into four, retroactively lowering rates. That includes dropping the top rate and corporate rates from 6.5% to 6 well, this morning, Representative Mike Moyle of Star and Steve Harris of Meridian, they did formally introduce House Bill 436. And they told the committee this bill would help small businesses with the growth throughout the state by lowering tax rates while giving money back to every Idahoan. Where did this money come from? Income, sales, corporate taxes. Where is this money focused? Rebate, you could use it for sales tax, and income tax reduction. We're trying to put the money back where it came from. It's helpful to all Idahoans. Every Idahoan benefits from this bill, and I want to emphasize that. At 75 bucks a pop, too. A majority of those who spoke against the bill say it gives more relief to the wealthy, that it puts those at lower incomes at a disadvantage. Much of that debate didn't focus on income tax after all, however, or at all, I should say, rather property tax relief and the grocery tax. And while some lawmakers say they're in favor of the bill, they add it's not what their constituents are asking for. I've had zero people ask me for this type of income tax uh, reduction, but I have had many people ask me in regards to property tax and grocery tax um, reform and repeal. Just while I've been sitting here, I've been getting multiple emails um, asking me to not vote for this motion um, and that they are wanting property tax and, and or grocery tax relief. So while this I consider breadcrumbs um, as far as tax relief goes, uh, breadcrumbs can still feed you a little bit. I really do worry that we're not going to have the money to to do everything we have to do. And property tax relief should have been the priority. Breadcrumbs or not, Representative Nichols voted for that motion, by the way. Representative Moyle saying there is more to do with property tax relief. He even alluded to a bipartisan property tax relief bill, but it's not quite ready to be presented to the House just yet. His suggestion, get the money back into the pockets of the people who need it now, sooner, and then work on fine-tuning that property tax relief legislation. 
By the way, as I mentioned, Representative Nichols went on to vote for the bill, but said she does reserve the right to change her mind when she goes out to the House floor. The bill passed along party lines. Representatives Laura Nekachea, James Rukti, both Democrats from Boise, voted against the bill. Again, it's going to the House floor with a do-pass recommendation. If, if the current trends continue, uh, you know, we would expect uh, crisis standards of care probably in the near future. Already, once again, some of Idaho's intensive care units are overflowing. It's a ripple effect and one that has had the worst effect on one North Idaho family. All right, let's see them. Your text messages about the 208. What did you think we were talking about? Anyway, send all that nervous energy and even your anger our way. But we'd rather see the good stuff. 208-321-5614. Don't forget the do's and don'ts. Do include your name and the hashtag the 208. Don't use bad grammar or foul language because we want to share yours at the end of the show. It was technically not scheduled to launch until tomorrow, but the federal government's free at-home COVID test site, well, went off a little early. Good news for those who have been having a hard time finding at-home COVID tests. And if you haven't already gone on, online that is, and ordered yours, it takes all of 30 seconds. So you should do that, I guess. All you have to do is go to the website. That's the one you see at the bottom of your, did see on the bottom of your screen. And you just enter your first, last name, your email, your shipping address, click checkout now, and that's it. No insurance needed. So it's that simple. You're going to get a four, you're, you will get four tests per address, and you have more than four people living under one, under one roof. Unfortunately, you're only going to able, be able to get just four tests. But they're not going to show, they're not going to show up like Amazon the next day. They won't start shipping those out until the end of the month, and it should take about a week or two to get to your home. So right now, if you do need a check, well, check your, or a test, check your local pharmacies. As of Saturday, private and group insurance companies required to cover the cost of up to eight at-home rapid tests per month per insured person. So there's that. And while there are ways to help keep yourself and your loved ones and others around you as safe as you can possibly be from COVID, the truth is Omicron is extremely contagious, this latest variant. We've seen it firsthand. I'm sure you've seen it too. Hope is that should you get it and you're vaccinated and you're boosted, your symptoms are mild and manageable. It's certainly not perfect, the vaccine. Some will still need expert care. Some will still end up in the hospital and some will still die, sadly. More than 4,000 Idahoans already have. We've seen a lot of obituaries over the last two years or so, or a year and a half, that spell out clearly how a loved one caught COVID, fought it in a hospital, but fell short. But there was one obit from North Idaho that caught our eye, not because it claimed a death from COVID, but because of COVID. This was in the Lewiston Tribune over the weekend, and there aren't many more words needed other than the first paragraph of this obituary. Catherine Jane Ripley, 33, died Friday, January 7th, 2022, in the ER of the Gritman Medical Center, surrounded by family members after spending more than 20 hours waiting for an ICU bed to open up somewhere in Idaho, Montana, or Washington. There were no beds available, thanks to unvaccinated COVID-19 patients. 
Oh, there's the last paragraph as well. They went on to say, please get vaccinated against COVID-19. Your actions really do affect others. for those sunrises and sunsets. We get some of the prettiest here in the gym state, I think. Now, anybody getting used to the inversion conditions yet? I think the folks living up in the mountains, they could deal with it for a while longer because most of the time we're getting sunshine up in the higher elevations and some warmer temperatures. In fact, Stanley, warmer than Boise at this hour, 33 degrees in Stanley, 32 in Boise. Ultimately, it is the high pressure ridge that will be our weather story heading through the next several days. Maybe even the end of January into the beginning of February before we see a major pattern shift, but this week's short wave will give us a little relief from the inversion conditions on Thursday and even bring some precipitation to the region as well. Tomorrow, starting with fog, breaking apart to mostly cloudy, maybe even times of partly cloudy skies tomorrow afternoon, hoping we can get a little sunshine in here tomorrow afternoon. And then the snow showers arrive in our central mountains by Thursday morning and stick around with us into the afternoon. Here in the valley locations, we're looking for snow to change over to rain as temperatures climb into the upper 30s on Thursday afternoon and then the scattered snow shower activity will continue into the overnight hours Thursday into early Friday for maybe a light coating along the foothills and in parts of the upper Treasure Valley it's possible but for the most part we're looking for snow to fall in the higher elevations maybe a couple of inches by the time Thursday's over here's a look at the seven day forecast with which shows us that the ridge rebuilds into the weekend so inversion conditions will return once again, but hoping we can get a little more sunshine Saturday and Sunday.
All right, lots of ideas sent in today on what to do with that two, nearly $2 billion surplus Idaho has, plus all the rental fees, property taxes. Let's start with this one from David in Boise. A $10,000 pay raise for all public school teachers would amount to about 15% of the state's nearly $2 billion surplus. That would be a start to getting Idaho's school system out of the bottom of the state rankings for education funding, he says. How about this? If the legislature stopped taxing food, it would get, give everyone 6% more money to buy food products. Could make a large difference in many Idahoans' lives. That's what Ina has to say, and a lot of people feel the same way as you, Ina. When our daughter was attending college in northern Idaho, she was hit with hundreds of dollars for application fees for rentals that were already rented. The landlord pocketed her money. No background check was performed. This law is bad, and that's the scam that... Councilwoman Sanchez was talking about. Okay to tell people to go live somewhere else. Just don't expect service at a restaurant, grocery store, daycare, and many others, says Judy. Excellent point. Brian, male or female, all of the rest is intended to justify people who have been brainwashed in believing the lie that we need to accept someone's mental and sexual confusion. Transgender is a lie and mental illness is gender fluid. No, don't add the words. Although we've become tolerable to the LGBT community, no business owner should have to deal with their flamboyant ways. Okay.